Welcome to the show. Today we got Niall Saunders comes to us from 2017 Harlequins, the 2021 Tel Aviv Heat, as he's got on his hat there, uh, 2022 Utah Warriors, and now uh, officially part of the Atlanta team. How's yeah. it been, man? No, nah, it's been a uh, look, it's not been the most ideal year, but um now nah, look i'm just i'm grateful for the opportunity atlanta giving me and uh look i'm really happy to be here it's uh it's a great great team um it's the one team that i actually had always wanted to kind of play for kind of get in touch with so you know this was uh definitely a mutual a bit a mutual decision for me to uh to come here and uh look so far loving it um the weather's been great the boys have been unreal everyone's been super welcoming and um Look, they've been looking after me so well here. So, uh, yeah, zero complaints and uh, just a big smile at the moment. Good, man. I'm glad I'm glad you're doing well. I'm glad you enjoy it. Tell me, what, what were some of the things that made you want to actually play for play for the, the Atlanta team? Uh, so, um, yeah, look, it's uh, without getting bogged down on too much of the of the negatives, but um, that's why I do think it's important that um, I kind of share my side because um i've kind of had to to kind of sit on it and, and not be able to vocalize how how i've been feeling but you know now the dust has settled and um you know i've kind of seen i can see the picture now a lot clearer and i can understand what's gone on um and to be honest it was it was more of a it was I, the situation was i'd been given a call in the summer from uh, the new coach and um, he he told me that I was going to be, you know, starting as as I'd kind of I'd expected to because you know uh, that's kind of what I was signed to Utah to do. And then you know there was complications. Uh, I mean, I think it was just one person not really understanding his job. Our team manager, um, look, I'll name him as Brandon Sparks because you know he needs to be named to be honest. But he um, he basically didn't understand. Uh, that you can only have 10 internationals in a, in a match day roster of 23. Uh, he obviously didn't know that for whatever reason, not too sure why, but he thought it was at the match day 15. Uh, so he actually went away and sold an international spot, which was, I mean, I don't know why, but he, he also didn't, I'd heard that he hadn't spoken to anyone about it. He just went and sold it. So this is when it gets a bit, you know, a bit fishy was I came two weeks before the season started um, I'd done the whole preseason, you know. I'd done done my part, you know. Did did as did did as well as I could, and um, yeah. Two weeks before the season starts, they pulled me in for a meeting, and then had said, "Oh, by the way," um, and with, this is something they'd known for a couple of months because I'd been told by you know that I will basically not be able to play every game this season. That they had sold an international spot, and they're going to have to make sure that the nine, one of the nine spaces, has to be an American uh, qualified player. So meaning that. Uh, we only had one American nine and two internationals. So uh, they basically told me that I'm going to be sharing game time. And if I wasn't playing, I was going to be at home. So from going from being the starter to, I mean, I was told I was only going to be playing half the season. You know, I came over to the MLR to, to, to be a starter. And that's kind of where, if I'm being honest, is where I see myself. I see myself as being a starter. And um, and that's kind of what the, I was, I, I mean, Utah had signed me and that's what they told me. And that's, that's everything that they'd sold to me that that was going to be the case. But obviously, to be fair to the coach Cooper, he had he had no control in this because he was basically uh, he was told this information at the same time. Uh, but Brandon, on the other hand, knew this whole time, and you know. So I obviously pulled them aside and said, "Look, guys, I, I appreciate that's the situation, but you have to understand from my point of view. I'm 25 now. I want to be playing every week. I feel like I should be playing every week." Um, but I'm going to have to leave because it's not what I want to do, but I'm going to, I have to look up for myself and look, I'm 25 game time is, is everything at the moment. You know, you have to be playing every week if you want to be seen, you know? So, um, I told them and there was, they were obviously not, not obviously, you know, happy, but they were understood that I couldn't, and they understood and they did facilitate and they told me to, uh, to go look for clubs as well. And they were also going to look for clubs for me as well. Um, so yeah, they, and then, yeah, so we basically had this mutual agreement that we were both going to look for clubs, but the problem was, was telling me two weeks before the season starts is, 
that's a pretty sly move because you know I, I couldn't leave because every other team has had got their nine spots sorted. You know, everyone's got their budget. Everyone's they're in they're at the end of preseason. Everyone's got everything together. No one's looking for a nine. You know, no one has the budget for a nine. No one has the international space for for an international. So, um, and and from what I was told is they knew that was the case. They they knew that I they were going to try force me to stay uh, because I'd have no option, but. I felt personally it was just a massive amount of disrespect and it's something that I think was completely uncalled for uh, considering, uh, I mean, yeah, I've been pretty loyal to Utah. So I, I was pretty shocked that they were, they were, they really treated me like that. I mean, it was one individual, but yeah, I felt like a massive amount of disrespect. So I said, look, I'm going to have to leave. And so we'd gone through eight weeks of looking for clubs Look, I don't want to get bogged down in too much of the details, but he he basically told me, he basically just lied and said the club didn't want me, but they did want me. And he wanted to try salvage this whole mistake by trying to trade me for a, for a second row. And um, yeah, I obviously found out that he was, he told me it was going to be a free trade. He promised me it was a free trade. He looked me in the eye and promised me that he wasn't going to get anything for me. So it looked make it look a bit more attractive for someone to to bring me in because they would never have to give any, anything to Utah. But then Houston had called me and said they wanted me. And then I asked Brandon about that. And Brandon said, no, no, sorry. Brandon told me Houston. He said, no, they don't want you. And then I got a call from the head coach and he's saying, no, no, we do want you. We, we've we just told Brandon that we do want you. Uh, he's lying to you. Uh, so, yeah, look, I don't want to get bogged down too much of the details. Utah, I think the, the boys were unbelievable. I love the boys, the coaches, Rob... Um, Sean Davies, Robbie Abel and and Coops, you know, great people, great coaches. You know, I, I love playing for them. Um, I would love to still play for them. But yeah, one individual, I think, is is uh, is sinking, sinking that Utah ship. Look, it's, it is what it is. I'm uh, I'm I'm totally I'm content with it at the moment. And look, I'm just happy that I can I can still play this season because, you know, I'd, I'd, I've been sat on the sidelines for you know, eight weeks at that point, eight, nine weeks, you know, someone who I thought I'd be playing every week. And it's, it's quite, uh, it's for sure, very, very frustrating time in my rugby career. And it was probably one of the lowest points, if I'm going to be honest about with my rugby career. And it, it kind of made me, you know, start to just, you know, dislike being in that environment. So I think that the best thing for me was to just to get out and, and leave. Um, and that's exactly what I did. To be honest with you, Will, I'd, uh, I'd been warned. Of, he'd, he'd, I'd been warned by people to to watch out. And that he was, he would, I mean, to quote from someone that he'd sell his own child to, to make, to get any, to gain anything. So look, I'm happy I'm still in the MLR. Um, Atlanta has been a breath of fresh air. It's, uh, I mean, I couldn't ask for more, you know. I think Atlanta's been been a great step, and I cannot wait to uh, to put on that jersey. And uh, yeah, I, I can't wait to finish the season and hopefully help uh, help Atlanta get to the finals, and you know, hopefully win this thing, you know, because that's that's been the goal this whole time was to win the MLR. And I really feel like the with the talent and the quality and and the, you know the quality of coaching here is has been. I mean, it's been amazing, and uh, the boys are you know they're a tight group. Um, and yeah, there's some serious talented boards here, and I, I can't wait to uh, to get on the pitch with them. I will say, everyone that I've talked to, every player that I've talked to, Danny, Saya, Paul, dude, they all love you, man. So they were all yeah. like upset to see you go. Like that, yeah. you know that that sucks to to lose out on somebody. And I'm sorry that you have sour grapes, or or I shouldn't say sour grapes, but a bad you know, taste no, in your I mouth. You, mate. Yeah, you I mean, know what I'm really, saying, like. You know? Yeah, but look, it was it not... was seriously it was seriously comforting actually to uh because I mean more or less the whole squad reached out to me whether they came up to came to my house personally or, or gave me a phone call or texted me and uh, even to be honest even the coaches as well um they all reached out to me and they all came to see me and uh yeah they'd all they'd all shown shown their appreciation to me and and how obviously they were gutted that I was leaving and. They've shown their, you know, they've they've really expressed how they felt. So it was nice and reassuring, you know, to to hear that, and you know, and also to have some some, some support in in a pretty in a pretty bleak time, you know. Um, but yeah, the support from the Utah boys, and like I said, I couldn't fault the boys. The boys were, you know, some friends for life for real. Honestly, there's some some friends for life I have there. So you know, I'm grateful for the time I I was there. Um, in Utah because at the end of the day, I did make some great friends and I did get to play some great rugby. 
um, on the pitch. But yeah, it's just a shame um, that I had to end that way. But, you know, no point looking in the past. I'm just looking forward now. So Onwards and upwards, my guy. Onwards no, exactly. and upwards. <laughs> All right, man. Well, and, and this is kind of an interesting concept because you left rugby uh, about 22 because you mm. you kind of felt burnt out. You had you had yeah. some medical issues that you needed to take care of. What yeah. was that like stepping away from the premiership? Wow. So it was um, it was definitely an interesting time in my life because, you know, being, you know, obviously I've been playing rugby since I was about five. I've been involved with uh, Harlequin since about 12. Obviously, my dad being captain of Ireland, um, there was this, you know, a huge identity that I had was anyone who'd ever known me or heard my name would have been, oh, that's not, he's the rugby player, you know? So it was a massive part of my identity was being a rugby player. So to step away from that, you, it really is, it, you, you, it made me, you know, realise, uh, it made me realise a lot of things, you know, realise Maybe for, for one, it made me realize that rugby wasn't maybe everything that I had built up to be in my head. It wasn't the be all and end all. Um, it was definitely tough to kind of understand who I was and, and what I wanted to do because I was burnt out. I just wasn't enjoying the rugby uh, side of it. And, you know, it's a it's a common thing. People always see the rugby. They always see the Saturdays and they think, everyone who I, when I stopped playing, they always... How, why would you want to stop? My rugby's rugby's awesome. You just run around the pitch for a living. But it's, it's obviously so much more than that, you know? There's so much more to it. It's just the Saturdays is just the, the, the cherry on top of, of all the hard work that you put in through the week and then you get to express yourself on the pitch, which is, I love doing that. I love playing rugby. I love playing the actual side of it. But I've been at Harlequin since I was 12 in the same training facilities, you know? And you kind of... I just kind of built up this, it was just, I was just craving to go do something different and go doing something, you know, I've always, I've always played rugby. I've always been the rugby player. So I was just craving a new opportunity and to go and to go live, you know, a different type of life. So it was, it was definitely hard, you know, and it was hard for my family. It was hard for my friends because they couldn't understand my headspace because I'd blocked all these feelings up for so long that when it did finally come out, it didn't, it might have not seen as, they hadn't seen the whole two years of the build-up of me wanting to do this. You know, they've only just seen the the week that I decided to stop. So, yeah, it was tough, but um, and I can honestly say this: it was the best decision I ever made because um, I was definitely heading down a, a pretty dark path where I was seriously, seriously, uh, like depression was was a big, big, big issue for me. And um, yeah, and I, I was I did the classic where you know I didn't speak to anyone about it. I just I just didn't want to like, you know, formalize these ideas because I was also scared of 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 actually making the call of of stopping to play rugby because you know it's a big deal because it's not only is it was it my passion but it was also my livelihood. You know, it's how I earned money. So yeah, at the time I was uh, it was definitely it was definitely a big call, but I, I honestly can hand on heart say that it was the best decision I ever made. And now when I'm playing rugby here. It's, it's such a different feeling when I play. It's I actually I'm playing and I'm I'm really enjoying. I'm really like I'm really focused and I'm just I'm enjoying my rugby a lot more here. You know, in the MLR or wherever I'm playing in Tel Aviv. It just it is just it's a different type of feeling I'm playing and it's definitely something that I can see myself doing for a lot longer. Whereas playing in the Premiership, it for me and this isn't the case for everyone, but for me, it sucked all the fun out of it. You know, you started playing rugby like at a super young age but you got in invested into the quins at 12 yeah look uh the quins yeah quins at 12 um yeah and i just did the academy and then yeah stayed in it right the way till 18 and then got the got the contract and then went straight from school straight to uh straight into professional rugby so yeah it was a uh, it was about 11 years of of uh that same that same place i was going to and and obviously quins being my boyhood club you know it's I've always supported Quinns and uh, I still support Quinns now. Um, yeah, it just felt like I was, you know, I was just doing the same stuff every week and I wasn't getting excited and I was just craving a bit of excitement, you know, and like playing, I think the Stoop's a great place to go play rugby, but if you're not being excited by playing in a packed out Stoop, then you're, for me, being a Quinn supporter since I was five years old, you're never going to be excited playing rugby. So, and I was just craving that excitement, you know, craving that like, that you know that that will to 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 really train hard and to really like push myself and I just didn't 
I started to feel like that was that was uh that was going down. The way I kind of describe it is like professional sport is it 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 can't just be a job, you know, it's a passion. You have to it has to be a passion because as soon as you start treating it like a job, that's when you're just gonna start to plummet. Because it's not at the end of the day, I know we might be paid for it, but it's it's much more than like a nine to five job. You know, you you really have to like push yourself every week. And when when I was feeling that the juice wasn't worth the squeeze, that's when I was starting to realize and that's when I started to understand that maybe maybe this isn't all I wanted to do, you know, and, and I wanted to go try other avenues and maybe go play rugby somewhere else. And, you know, and I just thought taking a break was was the best, the best, uh, the best thing I could have done. What is it about the MLR that made it where it was easier? Obviously, the season's less, but like, can you speak to that at all? Yeah. So I think the MLR, look, the one thing I think it's awesome about this league is you get to travel the whole states, you know, and being from Europe, you know, it's it's not something that, you know, many, if if any, people get to really do it. And not to mention that, you know, you're getting paid to to travel from Seattle all the way to New York and play at these great grounds and, you know, and you're kind of building a sport somewhere that it's not, you kind of get to pioneer the sport a bit um, in a country where it's not, you know, the, the main sport. So that was definitely appealing was the, the, the ability, the idea of, sorry, of being able to travel around the States and also not to mention, um, my old man my dad uh, he he kind of just he was the one who actually showed me to the MLR and he said hey look mate when uh why don't you just go look at the the MLR you know it's six months on six months off you know and that's perfect for you you know you get to travel you get to do every you get that excitement it's a new league it's you know you'll you'll do well and all that kind of stuff so yeah the the MLR I think it's it's a super appealing league especially being from Europe you know not being able to being able to travel the states you know so yeah I, it's uh I definitely don't regret the decision. I think it's been it's been awesome so far, and uh, yeah, I've, I've got to see, you know, so many places I never thought I'd be able to see. You know, would you recommend that to be the case for anybody that's inside of like the Premiership? I mean, for sure. I think it's. I mean, it's. To be honest, I think anyone anyone who wants to go travel but also get a different perspective of rugby, it's a perfect league because look, it's 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 building. This league's building. I honestly do think in a, in you know, 10, 10, 15 years, this could be a, a proper, a proper league that people respect, um, you know, in world rugby. So um, I think if you're, if you're young, if you're struggling for minutes, I think that's a great opportunity to come over here. Um, I think if you're, if you're just looking for some excitement, I think it's a great opportunity to come over here. You know, I, I think there's any, any rugby player can come play over here. It's, it's the, it's uh, it's just it's just an exciting league to play in. It really is. How do you stay motivated and focused during like tough games or setbacks or anything like that, and in, inside the the match itself? Uh, right, that's a it's a great question because like I mean, it, it's happened to me many times in in, uh, in my career. But I mean, how can I answer this? This is, I guess it's it's it all comes. But you know what? The best thing about being in that situation is you've also got twenty two other lads who are in the same situation. You know, so you've got two, 22 other lads who are also equally upset, equally annoyed and, uh, you know, in the same situation. And you've also got a coach as well, who's also equally upset. So the best thing about that is sometimes, you know, sometimes you go through those real rough patches, you know, like um, losing, I know, I, I lost 60, 60 points to five one game. I, I can't remember who it was. I think I was playing for Isha um, on, on loan and we lost 60 points to five. What can a coach say? What can the coach say? What can you say, you know, to to your teammates? The best thing about that is you honestly, it's it's an opportunity to come together because that's the the way that I would deal with it is 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 connecting with the other teammates and you know finding out what went wrong. When you're on the pitch, it's obviously a lot different. When you're on the pitch, it's you're you're kind of forced to try find a an answer within two minutes. But realistically. That doesn't happen, you know. So the way I'd say motivated would be is uh, it's just more of an it's more of a mindset of okay, nothing's going right, nothing's going well. We're down by 30, 40 points. What can I do? Well, how can I influence that? The only way that I would think is is just to work as hard as you can and do all the basics correctly. So if 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 I ever was to find myself, and I'm sure I will, I'm sure I will find myself in the situation again is you know and it's just it's just part of the sport and it's part of being 
being a rugby player or part of playing any sport is you're going to find yourself in these tough times. But the beautiful thing about rugby is, and it's unlike any team sport that I've played before, is you really, it's, it's, it's a different kind of bond that you have with someone, you know, when you're running onto the pitch and you've got 15 men, you know, who will want to run you down and, and, you know, kick the shit out of you realistically. And you've got 14 men with you who want to do the same. And, you know, I, I, it's, it's definitely a, um, it's, 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 look, it's tough and it's not always something that's, it's easy to do, but um, yeah, I, my, my, uh, my reaction would be on the pitch is to uh, just to do all the basics, right. And to, uh, and to, yeah, work as hard as I can with that, you know, running, tackling, whatever. And then after the game, it's, it's getting around your mates because look, no one wants to be shouted at after the game when you just lost 60 points to five. You know, it's not, it's never really you usually down to a lack of effort. It's just to lack of maybe, you know, planning or, you know, sometimes the team is just so much better than your team. And that sometimes you just have to swallow that, swallow that pill because it's bitter. But sometimes you have to humble yourself and understand that it's not always, you're not always going to win. And, and uh, rugby definitely as a sport, uh, it's a lot easier to lose because, yeah, I just feel like when, when we lose, it's a great opportunity to get even closer with your mates and, uh, and work through those issues. So, yeah, that's how I would say motivated. So I have it on good terms that you've had to spin the wheel of punishment uh, a couple of times, uh, yeah, look, maybe more than a couple record. of times. Yeah, I, I think somebody was... said that you were the uh, the master of fines or fine master. Yeah, I look, I'll take that. That was all me. I don't know what it was. <laughs> I don't know what it was. I just the boys were ruthless, you know, and I just don't think I was prepared for it. But yeah, I was <laughs> I was up spinning twice a week sometimes, you know, two three times a week. <laughs> so yeah, and there's only so many times you can, you know, some you can pay as well. You pay twenty dollars or you spin and. Look, I I love uh, I love a bit of a gamble, so I'd always spin. I'd never pay, but it got to the point where look, there's only so many hair alterations and and uh, dresses you've got to wear after the game, and how many times you feed your, you know, there was I started having to pay, and I think even with paying, I still racked up the most money. So look, and all that money goes to the the beer, the beer money anyway, so it's a win-win. But, yeah, yeah, you get it back in the end, right? <laughs> yeah. But like, I'm working on it. I'm trying to be a bit more organized and uh, not leave my notebook or leave my water bottle or, you know, leave my jumper in the gym. Because, yeah, look, you're going to spin for that. So, yeah, I'm so trying, that, my, is, trying my to organize. Are those all the kinds of things that you, that would get you a wheel of punishment kind of thing? Yeah. So anything from being late to a meeting, late to a physio appointment, um, leaving your i mean utah utah was was ruthless for it there was you could forget your jumper for like a second and someone picks it up and it's you've got to find you know it's they were they were they were ruthless with it and look i'm all for it you know because i was the first one to call someone else out so uh i was the first one to snitch on someone else so look i i hold my hands up i was the worst for it but yeah it was i quite i, I thought i quite like that culture i think it's uh I love the fine culture. I think it's uh, it's great for every team. So yeah, some, hopefully some one day I can be, uh, Yeah, exactly. Hopefully one day I can be the because they call it the sheriff, who's the the guy in charge. Hopefully one day I can work myself up to the sheriff, and you know, I can be fineless and I can corrupt everyone else. So nah, I'm joking. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's definitely uh, it's it's great for the culture. Um, I haven't seen, I haven't got a fine just yet. So I'm a clean slate over in here in Atlanta, but it's only it's only been four days but we'll see i'll talk to you at the end of the season and, and uh we'll see how many about that <laughs> so what what were what was like one of the worst things on the wheel like that you absolutely were like all right i'll pay oh, i had to do a um a dance video and put it on my socials which was pretty brutal <laughs> mate. yeah that was that was pretty rough that that's that one the acapella song in front of the squad that was pretty rough because you know i look i can do many things but i can't sing um so, you know having some you know some english geezer with a terrible voice sing in front of a load of americans you know it wasn't easy um but the hair alterations the other one that's pretty pretty brutal because you know if they're not happy with your i mean that's anything from a mohawk to to dyeing your hair pink or anything you know i'm sure you've seen the likes of sire when he had his big blonde beard like the I wanted to person. bring it back, man. I think it was a good I thought, look on I him. thought he looked good. I thought, and look, you know what? If I was playing against him, I would throw the ball into touch before running into him. So, you know, he's 
He's already a terrifying man, but with that, he looked, whoa. Or Paul Mullen, that was the other one. I thought that was one of the best. He had the, the handlebars with the mohawk. I thought he, that was pretty exceptional. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those are the kind of finds. But yeah, they're, they're pretty brutal, mate. I'm not going to lie, but there's also on the wheel, you have a, a free pass as well. So like you can land it and then you don't get any fine. So that's the, you kind of run the gauntlet a bit. So I was always looking for that, that free pass. And I think I got it maybe three times, but I probably spun about 50. So look how dark I just got. <laughs> I know. That's crazy. That like happened like instantly, dude. Oh, listen, I don't know what happened. Yeah. I was just chilling in the sun for a second then. But no. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, man, how was playing for the uh, Irish under 20s national team? Oh man, that was uh, that's up there. Some of the best in my highlights of uh, of my rugby playing, honestly, because I, I was I was so lucky to be involved in that team with the likes of James Ryan, Jacob Stockdale, Hugo Keenan, you know Andrew Porter, uh, uh, the Jimmy O'Brien. There's about you know maybe six, seven of them went on to play for Ireland. And yeah, you know, Terry Kennedy, I mean, he's a sevens king at the moment. Yeah, look, I was I was, uh, I was, was so fortunate to be involved in the team that was because we, we actually, uh, we made history with that team because we were the first ever Irish team to make the, the under-20s final. And uh, yeah, I was, I was honestly just in, I was just in shock the whole time because I was still at school when I was playing for the 20 so... I hadn't really played any of that kind of high level rugby. So this was it was so new to me, but I was I was just so happy and so excited to be there. That was yeah, that was a great time, honestly. And also following on in my dad's footsteps, uh, you know, he obviously played for the twenties as well. And, you know, that was pretty cool. So we both got our jerseys hung up together. Um we both got our eighteens jerseys and our twenties jerseys hung up together um in the house so yeah that was a uh, that was special not just for me but for for my mom dad and brother and sister as well that was that was a cool experience for sure it's so hard to tell like what your career could do or what it wouldn't do do you feel like you would have a good like case to make about like being on that irish team right now because they are rolling dude look look they they are they're the best team in the world and they play the the best rugby as well so look i think i think uh I honestly think that if I'd stuck 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 at Queens, I, I I do genuinely believe in my heart that I would have played for Ireland, and and I'm okay with if anyone thinks that's bullshit, whatever. Like it doesn't mean anything. But I know myself that I feel like I would have played for Ireland, and and um, yeah, look, and that was that was obviously a big thing for me uh, was to to kind of give that dream up because when I when I stopped playing at Queens, I kind of knew that that was I was going to be kind of you know throwing that dream away as well, but. Um, no, nah, look, I'm I'm happy. I'm happy, but that would have been pretty cool, you know, to have the third shirt, the third and final shirt next to my dad's. But, um, you know, it takes a lot of blood, sweat and tears to get there. And uh, if I'm honest, I at that point in my career, I just wasn't ready to uh, to give it. And uh, I'm I'm OK with it. What was that growing up like with your dad being a, a national player? I mean, no, I obviously, mean... that that caused a lot of like turmoil within you of like, I'm not just a rugby player. I have other interests. Nah, like... it, it, if I'm being honest, mate, it was awesome. I, I loved it. Um, my dad is, yeah. Look, uh, I've I've seen the videos of him playing. He was he was some player in his day. Um, but yeah, it was it was also massive for me growing uh growing into a rugby player because I I'd, I'd had someone who was as close as you're going to get to me who's done it all before. He's been in all the situations. He's felt all the emotions. Um, I have, he's, he's, he's a massive, him and my mum are two of my biggest supporters and, you know, I, I couldn't have done anything. I wouldn't be able to achieve anything. And I know that's a cliche, but I mean that from the bottom of my heart. My mum and dad have, I've honestly been the biggest drivers of my career and geez, they've been everywhere, taking me everywhere. They've, they've shot, they've shared the pain with me. They've shared the, the elation with me. They've, they've been through it all and, you know, I, I was never, I never ever really felt lonely because I'd always have uh, my mom and dad to to talk to, you know, about about those those kind of issues and those those uh, you know, those emotions because you know they they lived it with me, you know, they lived through through it with me. So, yeah, look, I was incredibly fortunate, incredibly fortunate to have uh, to have you know someone who's played at that caliber, you know, on my side and and cheering me on and giving me all the advice and. 
And uh, yeah, look, I, I loved it, and I still love it, and I still I'm still proud to say it, and I still tell everyone that my dad played for Ireland, and he captained on his debut at 22 years old. I mean, you know, still that's that's an incredible achievement. I don't think anyone will ever achieve, um, and I'm pretty proud to say that my dad did. So yeah, look, I I, I think it's awesome, and uh, yeah, I, I think people when I speak to people as well, they're they're shocked about how 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 amazing it is, and you know, it's. I get to to brag about my dad for a bit, and which is you know something I love to do. So yeah, I loved it, and uh, yeah, I'm still gonna tell everyone I, I I meet you know that my dad played for Ireland and he captained them. So, dude, you go everywhere, like you yeah. are all over the place. I'm I'm told that I need to ask you about Thailand and Bali. <laughs> Look, I can't say I can't say anything about that on on here. No, we're, we're gonna keep it PG, mate. Um, no, I'm joking. Look, Bali and Thailand. Uh, who told you to say that? That must have been. I can't. Oh I can't no, give names, out my no sources, names, bro. Well played. Well played. I can't that, be telling people. Fair enough, mate. Fair enough. Um, look, Bali and Thailand. That was yeah. That was a great trip. Yeah, but you you travel all over the world. In fact, when you guys when you weren't playing for for the Utah Warriors this year, you were actually in South Africa. Yeah. What were you doing, man? So um, I so I actually played for the team. I played for the Tel Aviv. Um, it's actually there's there's a massive South African influence within the team, and I've just made some really 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 strong friends um from that team. So. I uh I was I was just kind of I was looking just to uh, he has a house he has a house down there so one of my mates Brad he um I just thought I'd go down and see it because I had the time and uh yeah I was kind of looking to maybe go play rugby in Australia at the time as well uh, before Atlanta had reached out so yeah I just thought I had had a couple of weeks why not head down to South Africa um to go stay with my mate and yeah look got some good training done down there and uh yeah got to see see a bit more of South Africa so. Yeah, look, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big, big advocate, big fan of traveling and, uh, and kind of getting into, going honestly anywhere, um, anywhere. I'm happy to go to go explore, to go experience new things. And South Africa was uh, just one of those countries that I'd wanted to see. I'd, I'd been before, but I'd been when I was 15, so this was a slightly different experience. But and also living with someone who's from there, uh, so I just got to see all the stuff that you'd never normally get to see, I guess, as a tourist. But yeah, it was it was awesome. I'm I'm gonna go back in November when I get a bit of time off after Tel Aviv. Uh, so yeah, look, love South Africa, but love traveling as well. Always always gonna try travel for sure. What's the most like intense rivalry you've ever played in? Uh, and then like, how did you keep your cool in those moments or in that mm. match? A great question. Uh, that is a great question. You know what? I would say. I actually would say a a game for the Tel Aviv Heat um, against the Black Lions. So, Black Lions, obviously notoriously a very strong rugby team, the Georgian team. Um, they'd never ever lost a game in the Super Cup, and we we drew to them away, and then we beat them at home, and then we faced them. So we actually we were the, we were the better team this season, and then we faced them in the final, and that was because yeah they look they're they're aggressive bunch of people and uh, they, they don't like us very much. They don't like us very much because we spoiled their party. You know, they'd never lost a game and, and uh, yeah, they came to they came to Israel and, uh, yeah, we, we put on a, on a proper show and, and uh, yeah, we just dismantled them. So, when we played them in the final, you know, it was, we were standing toe to toe in the tunnel and, you know, boys were, we were, we were fired up, we were focused and, uh, yeah, it was a pretty, pretty physical game. You know, it was a pretty physical game but, yeah, we actually end up coming up short, but that's rugby, and uh, you know it is what it is. Maybe we got we're gonna get them next year. Who knows? Well, I hope so. But yeah, that was a uh, man. That was a yeah. It was a uh, pretty electric in the in the tunnel. It was boys were you you knew you knew someone was getting red carded. That's what I said. You knew someone was going off, and you knew some there was gonna be some sort of fight in there for sure. I mean, I think within <laughs> within like five minutes there was a there was a scuffle or something. How much trash talk actually takes place on the rugby pitch? I'm 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 so like interested yeah. in this because do you think that there's yeah. more in in a scrum or more on the wings? Um, 
Matt, there's, there's a fair bit of the scrums. The scrums is probably because I, I, I live my game by the scrum. So I can kind of, I hear both sides. Because you know, I'm by the rut the whole time. I can, I'm always hearing it, you know. I'm always, <laughs> if, I'm not, if I'm not doing it myself, I can hear someone else usually shouting at me uh, for being an idiot. But yeah, look, um, the scrums definitely, that's where, because every look, everyone's stopped, everyone's paused. You get a bit of time to, you know. And it's usually, usually for me, it's usually the haircut. I usually get, for the chat about the haircut, maybe the goatee, uh, sometimes the tattoos, they, they, they get brought into it. Um, but look, you know, if you're going to give it, you better take it. And uh, yeah, man, like... What's yeah, been the just, funniest thing that, that somebody's said? Oh, there was a... Uh, uh, I've just heard some, I mean, some of my teammates as well, I've, I've heard some some boys say some funny stuff. I mean, some, some of our heads, like a receding hairline or someone and... And someone just go as a crack at that. Or I actually had quite a funny one. Um, a guy tried to mug off my tattoos, and uh, he's just started stuttering. And then I just burst out laughing, and I was just like, "Oh, unlucky mate. Maybe, maybe try the next scrum." And it was just like <laughs> the whole team, all the scrum, we were all laughing because he tried to say it, and um, he tried to call. He called me out for my tattoos, which was it was super unexpected as well. I didn't know who the guy was, but he just. He started saying how how terrible my tattoos were, and, but he was stuttering as he was saying it, and I was kind of looking at him like, "Okay, mate, yeah, just get me in the next scrum. Maybe think about what you're gonna say and get me in the next scrum." But there's been <laughs> there's been some yeah, there's been some wild stuff said, mate. But um, yeah, it's it's all part of the game, you know. Look, I'm not saying you can go call someone every name under the sun, but you know the cheeky comment now here now, you know, it's it's just all part of the game. What is the most rewarding aspect? of playing professional rugby? It's a great question. Um, you know what? Like, it's a big... It's actually... Sometimes, you know, look, it's... It, it's a sense of pride, you know, because you're playing, you're playing a sport at, at the highest level or the, at, at least a professional level. You're being paid to play a sport, which is essentially just a game, you know? I guess... You know, sometimes I know. Again, it sounds so cliche, but you know, when my cousins and and all that, and my nan and my grandparents and my mum and dad or whatever, and they're they're all. It's like a sense of pride, you know. It's you know, you some let's say you have a nine to five job. There's just not that sense of of pride, you know. People don't get as excited about a nine to five job than they do for professional any professional sport. So, I think that's that's pretty rewarding, you know, and. Maybe also the opportunity to to win big games. You know, th those those are the reasons you those are the reasons I play anywhere. I, I love I love playing. Some of the reasons I play is is playing a big game and and win a trophy or you know go out and, and be the underdogs and and win a massive game. That's that's pretty rewarding, mate. Like when when you when you come up against the odds and and you you shouldn't win a game and you do or you win a massive game and then you're in the changing rooms after with the, with the team. And you're you're all drinking beer, singing, chanting, and you know everyone's on. That those are some of the best moments you get, you know, because a lot of the times you're sat in the change room after and you've lost, lost, and you know no one really wants to speak, no one really wants to, you know, do anything. But when you win, man, when you win, especially when you win a big game, it's it's uh it's some feeling, mate. It's some feeling being in a group of people who are in the same position as you and is having the same feelings. You know, that that's pretty special. And that's something that, you know, when I stopped playing for that that time was I was kind of craving that that um that feeling of of winning a rugby game. And it just I don't know what it is. And I actually was speaking to Robbie Abel. He was saying the same thing because he just retired pretty much. And he was saying that like, man, it's he misses that feeling of, you know, going 80 minutes of you know, in in battle or whatever, you know, going real hard and smashing lads and being smashed or whatever, and then you grind out the win. You know, it's something that you set out all week to do and then, you know, your plan, you know, falls into place and then you win. And then next minute you're 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 enjoying a beer with the with the with the lads. And you know, that's it's pretty special. And uh, it's something that I know I'm gonna miss whenever uh I finish up uh rugby for good. I know I'm gonna miss that because yeah, it's a it's a pretty good feeling.